chapter 2 as we continue to take a look at the joy in suffering for the life of a Christian. The world can't claim this. The world can't claim this. But one thing we get to work with that the world doesn't have is mercy. Mercy. We serve a God of mercy. And we are told to show mercy to each other. Well, turn with me to Job chapter 2. If you please stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Job chapter 2. We're just going to read verses 11 through 13. We're going to take a look at this part of Job's story where he is suffering and in anguish. He's lost everything. Enter stage left, three friends. Job chapter 2, verse 11. Now when Job's three friends heard of all the adversity that had come upon him, they came each one from his own place, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite. And they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with Job and comfort him. Verse 12. When they lifted up their eyes at a distance and did not recognize him, they raised their voices and they wept. Each one of them tore his robe and threw dust over their heads towards the sky. Then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, with no one speaking a word to him, for they saw that his pain was very great. Please remain standing as we pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we dedicate right now this service to you. We thank you and praise you for the service that we've seen already. We've been able to praise you in so many ways. But right now, Lord, we need to hear what you have to say to us this morning through the book of Job. Through your whole scripture, Lord. But right now as we examine this book that you've placed in your word as your word and your word. We ask for your truth to be revealed to us right now through the power of the Spirit and the study of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. There's a level of relationship with God that can only be achieved through complete and total isolation. There's a level of walking with Him and a closeness with Him that you cannot feel if you have people and things surrounding you. If they're still holding a place in your life that they shouldn't or just their mere presence. Their mere presence can sometimes keep you from a certain closeness with God that God reserves a special grace and love for those who have experienced a time of absolute and total isolation from everybody and everything because we serve a faithful and merciful God who never leaves us or forsakes us. Amen? Amen. Job is at a point in his story where he thinks his suffering will never end. He's lost his children his wife doesn't see a point to go on. He's lost his savings. He's lost his paycheck, legacy, company, empire, integrity with those who are watching him. And as far as he knows, Job is wondering if he stands condemned under God. Now, we have just finished our passage last week, verse 10. Uh, you speak as uh, he's talking to his wife who said, hey, just, just give it up. Give up life. It's over for you. Verse 10, Job responds, You speak as one of the superstitious women speaks. Shall we just accept good from God and not adversity? And it said, In all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job did not stand condemned, but he wondered if he was because of what was going on around him. This is similar to where we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, perhaps if you're thinking the suffering of Christ and the suffering of Job, if you're to juxtapose the two, it, maybe it would look like the cross. No, no, it doesn't. See, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. He was completely sinless. The phrasing used for Job being upright and righteous or even uh, perfect in some translations, the Jewish understanding of perfect included the fact that we still have a sinful nature. They understood that. So when we read that Job is upright and righteous, that is within the context of still being a sinner. But Jesus, on the other hand, was the sinless, sinless Lamb of God. So we can't compare those sufferings. But let me, let me tell you something that comes close. 
this is going to be an exercise imagination. So I want you, if, if closing your eyes helps, find whatever it takes, or maybe even if you want to draw this out, just don't draw it out on the pew. That doesn't come off very well. But I'm, I'm going to depict for you a picture, and I just want you to imagine, whatever helps for you to imagine this, I want you to imagine that it's dark outside, you've got nothing on the landscape except grass and, and a bunch of trees, but there's one tree in the middle of this picture. One tree in the middle of this picture. On the left side of the tree, Jesus Christ is kneeling down, praying fervently, his hair's disheveled, sweat pouring off of his face. Matter of fact, as we're told in Scripture in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, is as Jesus was praying so intensely that the crucifixion not occur. He was praying so intensely that his, his sweat was dropping, as it were, drops of... Now, there's reason to believe, and there, there's still debates about this, but as you imagine this picture, it is very likely that there was actually blood in those drops. When someone is so stressed, so intense, some blood capillaries can start bursting, and blood can mix with the sweat. It can be a pretty gruesome, gritty scene. So I want you to imagine this. Jesus kneeling there, left side of the tree. He's praying, almost shaking with intensity, and, and there's, there's sweat just pouring off of him on the ground. It's not a pretty picture. Now, on the right side of the tree, I want you to put Job there. I want you to put Job reclining as well, scratching himself with pottery. And he's, his skin's bursting open. Infection and blood is oozing out as these boils just run rampant all over his body. And he is also praying while scratching himself intensely to try and alleviate what's coming and what's happening. That's the picture of suffering I want you to juxtapose because Jesus Christ was calling out for mercy. He was calling out for mercy. He said, please, if you can make this cup pass from me. I, I, I know I'm going to have to do this, but I don't want to drink of this cup of, of crucifixion. I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine Job. Look over there. And he's saying, I know I came here with nothing. I know I'm leaving with nothing, but I'm going to praise the name of the Lord. And he's also saying, you know, I will accept adversity and good both from the Lord. I'm not just going to accept one or the other. They're both suffering, but they're both calling out to mercy. At the top of that tree now, I want you to pan that picture a little bit. you got Jesus on the left side, Job on the right. And at the top, imagine a light. There's just a bright, shining light with with no real form or shape. And I want you to imagine that is God because that's what's happening here. They are both crying out in the same spirit, in agony, in suffering, in intense suffering, crying out to God for mercy, but hold the phone. There's one more similarity I want you to remember. They are both surrounded by their friends. Jesus is surrounded by friends who are reclining, and Job is surrounded by friends who are likely reclining. Jesus is surrounded by friends who are reclining so much, they fell asleep. While their great leader is suffering and in agony, begging for mercy, they could possibly be hands of mercy, and they're asleep. But they're with him. They're with him. Job's friends... We're going to get ready to see a picture unfold this morning. Job's friends are also reclining around him, surrounding him. And they sit there completely silent. Now as you turn your imagination back to attention now. Both Job and Jesus find themselves surrounded by disillusioned companions. Job was one of the greatest men of the East. He was a leader. He was a leader and well-respected. Both suffering from the feeling of total isolation. Both of them begging for mercy. Job was wanting an explanation. Jesus was wanting to avoid crucifixion. But they both still held this one tenet true, and that was, Your will be done. You are enough. Job is separated from anything that might help him heal. Even God's approval, as far as he's concerned, as far as he feels, he thinks this is God's judgment. He doesn't know. He says, I don't know why, but I want to know. This, this is in line with God's judgment, but, you know, I'm going to trust him. And then Job's friends show up. 
And you say, well, Mike, weren't they silent? Yeah, they were for a couple days, and then they didn't shut up for 20, over 20 chapters. <laughs> you look at Job, and you're like, oh, man, we're going to do a series on the book of Job. That's a lot of chapters. Yeah, don't worry. A lot of it's hot air. A lot of it's hot air. Now, take that with a grain of salt, because this is all the word of God. It is all holy, it's all sacred, and it's all the authority of his word. But he often reflects our fumbling attempts to understand his mighty will. I believe everything contained in the book of Job is the absolute and solid word of God. And this is for our learning this morning. And one of the things we're going to learn is that Job's friends take him back and try and accuse him again and again and again and again. Over and over and over. And for whatever reason, God decided to spell this out in long, long picture for us. He's going to make us go through all these chapters. Well, I'm not going to make us read through all these chapters this morning. But I want you to flip over to Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19, and go to verse 25. Job is just being hammered left and right. Well, you're probably in trouble because you sinned over here. You probably forgot to pray over here. You didn't do sacrifices over here. Or they say, you know, hey, we all know that God's not going to punish somebody that's righteous, Job. You obviously did something. And he's getting hammered again and again and again. His friends are putting him through the ringer. And God's over there like, well, I guess, Satan, you can have the day off. His friends got this one covered. <laughs> But look at this statement of faith that Job makes in, in Job chapter 19, verse 25. He says, you know, <laughs> basically this is the point. He says, all right, listen, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Job says, I, I don't have all the answers, okay? I don't have all the answers. I don't know. But there is one thing I do know, and that is my Redeemer lives. And we have the same statement of hope this morning. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you may not have all the answers to what's going on around you, and things may be turning south for you at this point in time. And you're, you're thinking, man, I, I don't know why this is happening. All right, hold the phone. Hold the phone. Your Redeemer lives. He's mighty, and you know what? He will work through your life right now, and he's coming back again. I don't know when the date or time is. Go to the Christian bookstore. You'll find some people that think they know, but don't worry about that because God said no man knows the day or the hour. He said, I'm coming back at any time. You don't know when I'm coming back. But when I come back, then you'll know. Then you'll know. And all nations of the earth will bow before him. Amen. We will be redeemed because our Redeemer lives. I believe there's one reason Job's friends had come running. <laughs> because they thought Job... Since he was upright and righteous and blameless, they said, well, there's no way. You know, his, his God, and remember, gods were regional, really, specifically at this point in time. Gods were regional, and so the other pagan uh, groups thought, well, hey, Yahweh, that's just a regional God. He takes care of his, his people over there. Well, Job wasn't even in what is considered the region of Israel. He was in that southern part of Israel. He was kind of in no man's land at that point in time. And they, but they, they, they thought Yahweh was pretty much just kind of you know, over that area. Well, they see Job fall, and they go, if a man like Job's going to fall, what about me? So what we've got here in the next 20-some-odd chapters is an investigation by Job's friends to say, what did you do wrong? I want to know so I don't do it. That's all that's going on here. As you read, you're going to see that language. They keep saying things over and over again like, Job, the righteous aren't punished. Job, the righteous aren't punished. And Job just keeps going, I don't know what I've done, but I am being punished, and I believe God's in this. I still believe God's in this, and I know my Redeemer lives. Eventually, he'll hear my case, but right now, I don't have any answers. And they said, no, we want answers. We want answers because they were in a superstitious culture. Their God was kind of like a vending machine. You do some favors, and you get some favors back. They didn't have this concept of an all-sovereign God who can work in joy and in suffering and keep the two together so that when we are in suffering, we can still find joy because we can find God. We can say, my Redeemer lives. They didn't understand that. 
They said, no, I need my God's favor and approval. I'm glad we don't hear that in the Christian message anymore. Yeah, approval is approval's all well and good, but sometimes we have translated approval to mean life feels good for me. I'm feeling positive about life. Therefore, God's favor must be on me. No, you found a way to feel positive about life. That's what that means. It's about right and wrong, not positive and negative. Unless you're jump-starting a, a battery, then it's about positive and negative. You know, I... I Remembered growing up, we had a, a little Sears Roebuck garden tractor, and I had a friend of mine over there. The battery had died, and we were trying to get it started up, and my friend had the two alligator clips. I had two ends hooked up to my dad's 1963 Ford F-100 farm truck over here, and my, my friend had these alligator clips, and I said, now you've done this before, right? And of course, as a 14-year-old uh, guy, he turns around, he's like, oh yeah, of course. Pop, 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 pop. Hooks the alligator clips up on the, po reverses the positive and negative on the batteries. Now I need a confession. Who else has done that in this room before? Okay, just a few of you. Okay, well I want to see you come forward after the end of the service. No. <laughs> now that situation was about positive and negative. All right, that did matter at that point in time. But in God's kingdom, it's not about positive and negative. It is about right and wrong. Because there are some of these trials that are going to come that are going to feel negative to us, but God is still working for what would be considered to be positive. So if we try to determine what is positive and negative to us, we're going to go around and round and round in circles, and we're going to take the world's answers because the world can find a lot of positive answers outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ that help us feel positive, but they lead to death. Or as Proverbs put it, the there's a way that seems right to a man, seems positive to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. For whatever reason, Job has give, God has given Job insight into this. But his friends aren't catching on. They investigate Job. Eliphaz is the typical, well, I don't mean to be rude, but... Job chapter 4, verse 2. Should someone venture a word with you, Job? Would you be discouraged? But who is able to restrain themselves from speaking? Job chapter 4, verse 7. Eliphaz just can't shut up. He says, please remember, who being blameless has perished? Who are the virtuous destroyed? He says, I don't mean to be rude, Job, but you know, I'm pretty sure God's punishing you, okay? I think you're just being a little cocky, Job. I don't mean to be rude, Job, but I think you did something wrong. What did you do? I want to know. But what did we just read? Job was defined by God to be righteous and upright. Eliphaz doesn't have any grounds for his accusations. He's just rambling. Job says, you know, he cares. He cares for me. I can't answer all your questions, but I know he cares for me. My Redeemer lives, Eliphaz. Shut up. He didn't say shut up. I said that. That's, that's what I wanted to say. Job was even ready to give up on himself. Job didn't understand, and he even thought, what have I done? What have I done? But he still couldn't come up with anything, so he just kept saying, all right, he cares for me. He cares for me. Bildad follows up by trying to tell Job, uh, saying, uh, you know, Job, this isn't the end of the world, as Job sits there scraping all of his boils, and he's lost all of his family and his savings and paycheck and company. And, <laughs> and Bildad says, hey, man, it's not the end of the world. I can just see Job slowly stopping to scratch, and he's like, if only I could get these boils on you, man. I want to see you with these boils, son. Job chapter 18, verse 2, Bildad says, How long before you set an end to words? In other words, how long do you just be quiet, man? Just stop whining. Job chapter 18, verse 3, Why are we considered stupid in your estimation? Bildad doesn't shut up yet. Job chapter 18, verse 4, all this goes on for chapters. I'm just giving you the lovely, lovely highlights here. He says, will the earth be abandoned because of you? In other words, Bildad says, man, is the world going to stop turning because of your problems right now? If you die, is the world going to stop turning? I don't know about you. I wouldn't be going out to eat with these friends. If they call me up, they're like, hey, man, you want to grab some steak this weekend? I'd be like, no. Do you remember what you said to me, right? Bildad said, is the world going to end because of your suffering? That wasn't the point. That's not what Job needed to hear. Job needed mercy. He needed mercy in his time of suffering. And God, who is a God of mercy, often sends us as his messengers of mercy. These three friends failed big time. Big time. God sends us as messengers of mercy. And he says, you know, listen, your world, the world's not going to end because of this. But you know, Job's world had come crashing down. 
As far as Job was concerned, the world had stopped spinning. As far as Job was concerned, life was over. He didn't know what the future held. The world might as well have just sat still. Please don't be an Eliphaz or a Bildad this morning. You might get slapped out of love. Job responds to this long interrogation with a plea for mercy. What I pointed out earlier in Job chapter 19, verse 25, he says, I know God's going to advocate for me. I know that I'm innocent. You think you have the place of interrogator in my life, but you don't. God is my judge and yours. Watch it. That's what Job's saying to his friends. You guys watch it. God's my advocate. He's my judge and yours. You watch it. Watch it. Because his friends, they were just trying to figure out how to stay safe. Why had this man fallen? They were making Job a case study. They weren't ministering to Job. They had investigated Job. Pause. I don't even need to make application here, do I? You catch my drift where I'm going here with the church? We're not called here to investigate each other. We are called here to minister to each other. We are to be ministers of mercy in each other's lives. And all too often, we come up like Job's friends, and we say, listen, the world's not going to end. It's not the end of the world just because you've got this going on. Or, or we step up and we just say, well, I, I know you did something wrong here. Let's find out what it is. Let's investigate. Because we get superstitious and we think that if we do good things for God, we should get good things back. And so if somebody's going through a rough time, we say, well, they must have done something bad to get something bad from God. That's superstitious. That's foolish. That's ignorance. I don't want to see that in this church. Let's make sure we're messengers of mercy and of truth. Because God cares for us. And if he's walking us through a time like this, there's a reason. There's a reason. There is joy in that suffering. Go all, all the way over with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, the first five verses. Jesus was still encountering this thousands and thousands of years later. This attitude that, hey, if you've got a problem, I I'm going to help you fix it. I'm going to help you fix it. Because obviously something's wrong. I'm going to be the judge. I'm going to judge that you've done something wrong and God's working with you. That's why you've got this problem. So let me help you. Let me help make you a righteous person. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. We read, Do not judge, Jesus is saying to us this morning, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you'll be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured back to you. Why, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the huge log that's sticking out of your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that tiny little speck out of your eye. And behold, you've got a huge log in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So it doesn't say don't, don't help your brother or sister out to take specks out of their eyes. It never says that. It says we're, we, are to be help, we are to be messengers of mercy and to be helping each other out. But when we come with this attitude of you did something wrong, I want to find out what it is. That in and of itself is the log in our own eye. That is us being judgmental. You tell me, when you approach, when you approach as an investigator, how does the person receive you? When you approach saying, you know... We all know what you did, and I'm pretty sure I know why you did it, and you need to change your ways. That's not how a Christian should act. Anybody in the church shouldn't be saying these kinds of things or doing these kinds of things. Obviously, you're doing something wrong because God's not blessing you over here. Don't get mad at God. You need to straighten things up in your own life. You just created a log, and what's a log? And if you've got a log sticking out of your eye, how, how close can that person get to you? What do you think he just did? You just created a barrier. Congratulations. You just joined the ranks of the disciples. Jesus said, don't do that. He said, you and I are to be messengers of mercy because we are to deliver the truth in love. That means we're able to give the truth with an embrace. In other words, here, I'm here to help you. I'm here to struggle with you. I'm here to falter with you. What can we do to get through this? Not, hey, you need to go there. It's, hey, come here. We're going to work on this together. We're going to work on this together. Now, Job's friends aren't really exhibiting that for us this morning. So I would like to say, hey, things turned around and Job's friends shaped up and now everything was all right. No, it gets a little worse. Zophar, 
He's the stereotypical one that says, I don't care what you say, I've got a gut feeling about this. I don't care about the facts, I'll rely on my feelings, thank you very much, said no one wise ever. <laughs> Zophar says, I don't know why, I just got a sense about these things. Yeah, that always works out well. I've got intuition. Oh, don't even get me started on that. Don't get God started on that. He's not a fan of that. So far comes up. He said, I've got a gut feeling about this, Job. I know you're wrong. He gets pretty gutsy on this. Go to Job chapter 20, verse 2. This cracks me up every time I read it. Start with verse 1. Job chapter 20, verse 1. Then Zophar, the Namathite, answered, Therefore... My disquieting thoughts make me respond even because of my inward agitation. I listen to the reproof which insults me and the spirit of my understanding makes me answer. You go back to the Hebrew on that phrase and he basically said there was another spirit beyond my understanding. And it wasn't, he's not talking about God's spirit here. He's not talking about God's spirit. He basically says there's a spirit beyond my understanding of this realm of mine. There's an extra knowledge I have that tells me you're wrong. I know you're wrong. Yeah, what's the proof? I don't know. I just know. Oh, that's great. Okay, that leads to a good relationship. Let's try that and see how well it works. Look at the fruit of that. Look at the fruit of those attitudes. I've seen parents do that before growing up. I've seen parents do that. You know, I don't know why. I just, I just know you're wrong. That never leads to a healthy relationship. That's pathetic. That's pathetic and it's superstitious. And Zo <laughs> Zophar takes that route. He said, Job, I've got a gut feeling about this. And he was wrong, obviously. By the end of the chapter, he's proven wrong. But none of his other friends have turned up anything good in this investigation. They just keep finding Job innocent. And Zophar says, you know what? I've got extra knowledge here. I know that 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 you're wrong. I just know. And he appeals to that. Zophar fell into the trap of claiming extra knowledge as power. He turned into a manipulator to try and get the answer out of Job. This morning, I'm afraid something we're going to struggle with here is working with God on a gut instinct level, especially when there's suffering and tragedy in another person's life and we're ministering to others and we just say things like, I, you know, I just, I really feel like God's do doing something here. Well, let, let's be careful when someone's suffering. You know, you can see God at work and give him praise and say, hey, I saw God working in my family's life this way, and then you spell it out. When he provided for, boom. When he's kept us safe during, boom. When he brought about healing in this relationship, boom. And you can give specific examples, but when we appeal to kind of this general abstract instinct, that doesn't give glory to God. That doesn't give glory to God. We've got to give him glory for what he has done. And we can do it. We don't have to sit there and scratch our heads. If you have to sit there and scratch your heads and say, what has God done in my life in the last week? Let me encourage you with this. Maybe you have too much noise on. Maybe you got too much entertainment on. Maybe you got too many events on your calendar. Maybe you don't have enough time with him. That's probably why you're not hearing him, because he's there and he's working. So I'd encourage you this week, may maybe if you're not hearing his voice, you're not hearing what he's actually doing and you find yourself appealing to gut instinct a lot, Take a step back. Ask what you can take off of your calendar, off of your day, to just hear his voice. And he'll be there. If you know Christ as Savior, he'll be there. And if you don't know Christ as Savior, he's here in his word for you to turn to Christ as Savior and hear him for the rest of your life. And when he calls your name, what does he say? When I call, my sheep know my voice. It doesn't have to be a gut instinct. This can be a relationship that you carry with you on through, into, and through eternity. You know, Jesus suffered during his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I gave you that picture, kind of a graphic picture of his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he suffered even more when he was faithful to the Father, obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. He suffered the word excruciating came from the type of pain experienced specifically during the crucifixion. He experienced excruciating pain and suffering when he died for your sins and for mine. 
the answer would come. You remember he asked the question, what was the question he asked on the cross? My God, my God, why have, why have you forsaken me? Job gives every impression that he feels forsaken. Whenever he says, my Redeemer lives, that was a statement of hope. That wasn't a statement of, my Redeemer is with me. He said, my Redeemer lives. I know he's coming. I can't really feel his presence right now. I feel abandoned. I mean, I'm just being honest with you guys. I don't have all the answers. I'm abandoned. I don't know what's going on, but I know he lives. I know he lives. And Jesus Christ on the cross, fully God, fully man, says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's asking why. The answer didn't come for three days. You know, if Jesus doesn't know how to get a vending machine answer, how do we have any hope of that? God, give me an explanation. Boom, there it is. Oh, thank you. So you know what? Sometimes he does that. Sometimes he does. But Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? And nobody got that answer for three more days until they came to an empty tomb. Why did Christ have to go through that? So that he could be raised again into newness of life and we could wash, come washed under his blood that he bled out on that cross and be raised with him through the resurrection. That's why that happened. But he didn't have the answer. Now you say, Mike, he was fully, yes, he was. I'm talking about as he was abandoned on that cross. It's a mystery that we're going to have trouble understanding. And guess what? Good news is we're not called to understand that. We're called to take that in faith because it is stated as an absolute truth in God's word. I don't have to suppose anything. It is printed plain as day. It must have seemed like an eternity. As Jesus lay buried in that tomb, it must have seemed like an eternity to Job as he sat there scratching himself, surrounded by friends who were just questioning and questioning and questioning and questioning him, saying, what could you have done differently, Job? Now, what, you should, what if you, you should have done this? You should have been over here. You don't think Job was already struggling with guilt? He was giving sacrifices on behalf of his children in case they sinned so that they would be kept safe, and they still died. So don't you think in the back of his mind, he's thinking, did I forget to do a sacrifice? What did I do? Well, why is God doing this to me? What did I do? Jesus being beaten and whipped and mocked and scorned made a laughing stock of the people he came to save. God, why have you forsaken me? This was Jesus' question. This was Job's question. Maybe it's your question, or maybe it's been a question you've been afraid to ask. Maybe you've been afraid to ask, why, why do I feel abandoned? Because you don't want to say those words. Say, if I, if I tell anybody I feel like God's abandoned me, they're just going to categorize me. Okay, we're back to the judgment topic again. If that's the kind of friends you've surrounded yourself with, judgmental friends who will categorize you when you have a faith struggle, find new friends. We've got a bunch here. We've got a bunch here who do walk a real faith walk, not a facade keeping face on Sunday mornings. We've got people here at this church. We've got a family together here that knows what it's like to lose family members and see God work strong. We've got family members here who have seen strong leaders and pillars at this church pass on into heaven and leave a vacuum of grieving and pain that's still being healed today. Talk to people here. If you've got someone that categorizes you, pray for them and then go find someone who will love you and minister to you out of mercy because we've got them here. Jesus trusted the work of his Father through the suffering and he was raised up and seated at the right hand of God. For those of us this morning who've dedicated our lives to follow Jesus Christ, I want to remind you this glorious, glorious truth. One day, we will all go to meet him. He will raise us up. He will raise us up. I'm not going to pretend to know what you're going through this week or what God has coming in the next week. I know this series is a little more sober, but guess what? There are people in this church right now walking through this kind of season of life. There are people right now in your influence area, your family, your school, walking through this exact same problem. 
They feel abandoned, they're suffering, and they're wondering when it'll end. Who's gonna be the messengers of mercy in their life and who's gonna be Job's friends? Are we gonna walk up and say, I just got a gut instinct, you did something wrong, you did something stupid, you kinda had this coming. And God says, good job, you just created a log in your own eye. Good luck getting the speck out of theirs. We've got to come to others, and we've got to come to God in a spirit of humility and mercy because he showed us mercy first. He showed us mercy so that we know how to show mercy. We'll all be raised up with him when he returns. We'll have strength for today. Hope for tomorrow to endure anything that crosses our paths in this lifetime. Our lifetime on the huge timeline of eternity as we close this morning. I want you to remember this. Take the timeline from the time God created the worlds in his hands. He, he spoke the world into existence until the time that he comes back and ends the world all under his control. This whole timeline's in his hand beginning to end. There wasn't some abstract evolution over here. There was a creator who created and we know him as savior. There will not be some random, universal, odd cause to the ending of the world. There will be Christ's return. It's all in his hands. This timeline, and you know what our life is compared to? Our life is as a vapor. Our life is as a vapor in this timeline of eternity that's all in God's hands. Our lifetime is as a vapor. Now, your suffering is going to seem like an eternity right now. Job admitted that. Jesus admitted that. It seems like it's going to go on forever. We got to step back and just say, he cares for me. In that priority, we're not number one in that statement. He, number one, God, ultimate. He cares, actively looking for us, giving us his word, showing us his mercy, reaching out to us in his, in his grace. He cares for me, and he cares for you. We're in this timeline right here. I don't know what suffering you're walking through, you've just walked through, or you've got coming down the pike, but I want you to remember this from this morning, a lesson from Job's friends, a lesson from Jesus and Job, both surrounded by friends who had, who had checked out, didn't know what to say, didn't know what to do. I want this to be a reminder that God cares for you. When you're completely alone, when you feel like you're alone, or when you are truly isolated, there is joy in suffering because God still cares for you. God still cared for Job even at this point in the story. He was still advocating for Job even while Job was suffering and being accused by his friends. God was still his advocate. But on his own timeline, on God's own timeline, trust that timeline. God will work in his own time. I am so grateful God doesn't work on my timeline, aren't you? If God worked on my timeline, I would be at a church in Longton, Kansas, out in the middle of nowhere right now. That's what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to go find a small country church that was kind of tucked out of the way. And so I, I hit that number. I just wanted to finish, you know, just kind of finish my degree and just, just take it easy. And, and I was trying to cut down on stress, you know, and I thought I'm going to go find this small country church out in the middle of nowhere, kind of near my family. And I clicked on the number for this church. And I didn't realize it till the end of the conversation. I was like, idiot, idiot, idiot. <laughs> Ask Olivia. There were divots in the wall where I was banging my head. After I hung up, I was like, man, idiot. God's up there chuckling. He's like, just hang on, man, hang on. Sit down, shut up, and let me work. <laughs> and the Lord opened the door a little bit, and I said, okay, he's still here. He's still working. In fact, Olivia, Olivia's like, are you going to call him back? I said, no, I'm not going to call him back. He's like, sorry, I called the wrong number. Can't even call the right number. Let me be your pastor. So, I waited, and I prayed, and the, we were with a small group at the time, and I told them, and they said exactly what Olivia said. They said, well, sounds like God's working there. And I'm like, what? It sounds like I'm an idiot. What do you mean it sounds like God's working? God can only work when I'm an idiot? And we're not going to go there because apparently he's working in me a lot of the time. But listen, listen, when I thought things were out of my control, I thought I called the wrong church, uh, the, the pressures of all these different jobs in the school, I'm like, this is, I don't know how we're going to make it, I don't know how we're going to make it, and God's like, just hold on, hold on. And the door kept opening up here at this church. There were several signs over and over again that God was working here and was calling us specifically to come here, that he had prepared the way, not because I'd done anything fantastic, but because he is fantastic. Amen. And he opened the doors 
and I was able to see him work even when I thought things were out of my control, and they were. And I kept turning it over to him, and next thing we know, he did not call me to a small country church to pastor. He called me to a church that is equipped with resources to house hundreds and hundreds of believers. He didn't call me to a storm shelter church. He called me to a salt shaker church. He didn't call me to a church where we all just kind of go in and huddle and just try and uh, tuck out of the way of life. He called us into a church where we come in and we get shook up with the word and work of God and we all get sent back out into the world to be his salt and his light. That's the kind of church he called me to. I don't know what the next chapter is in our story, and I don't know why we, we have several stories of suffering in our church even now. And, and I'm watching him work in these, and suffering will always be a part of life. Don't expect it'll go away. But he called me to a church that knows how to minister to each other when we're suffering. And I want to encourage you this morning as we close to keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. We, we want a list of faults and failures at this church? All right, I'll put a list out there, and we could all write some down. You want to make a list of things we could do better? Yeah, I write them all day long. But if, if we go back to the drawing board and we look at what God's blessed this church with, I can tell you one thing is for sure. I don't see many Bildads and Zophars out there this morning. I just forgot the name of the other guy, but I meant to name him. Come on, guys. See if you can beat me there. Bildad and Zophar. Who's the other guy? Eliphaz. Good job, guys. I owe you a lot of candy for that one. No Eliphazes, Bildads, or Zophars. Maybe you struggle with it. Maybe you're tempted to go there. But for whatever reason, this church, I've been impressed, has been very good at ministering to each other in mercy. Keep up the good work. Keep up the good work. That's how God is seen, and that's how his hands of mercy are spread here and outside these church walls. But I encourage you this morning, if you're in a time and, and you are in a time of suffering and struggling, turn it over to him. Know that He cares for you. Know that your Redeemer lives this morning. If you don't know Christ as Savior, make that change right now because I can't give you any of these promises. I can't give you any of these promises unless you know Christ as Savior. God's over there with His arms open wide saying, I want to help you. I want to be your advocate, but you've got to come to me. I'm holy. I'm holy. So you've got to walk through the blood of Jesus Christ to be able to come into my embrace. And He is willing that how many should perish? He is willing that how many should come to him? This invitation is to everybody this morning. If you need to know Christ as Savior, you need to dedicate your life to him. Then you move. Get up out of the comfortable, cushiony little pews. And you come up here. And you make that decision in front of your church family. Because we're going to encourage you. We're going to be the hands and arms of mercy. Yeah, we're going to make mistakes. Yeah, there's idiots like me here. Maybe I'm the only one. But we all follow Jesus Christ as Savior. And, and we are being transformed into His likeness. And I extend to you this opportunity to make that decision for your life as well if you'd join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just call out and cry out to you right now. Lord, you know the trials. You see into our hearts and minds right now. We can't hide anything from you, Lord. You know what's, what's burdening us this morning. You know what is stealing our thoughts and stealing our joy. Maybe we blamed it on other things, but you know what's really eating at us. Lord, maybe we've been surrounded by friends who are just taking us in circles and stealing chapters and chapters of our life with useless discussion and a lot of hot air. Lord, may we in the middle of all this just stand up and say, I don't know all the answers, but I know my Redeemer lives, and I will worship Him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, may we stand up and be hands of mercy Take our eyes off of our problems, give them to you, and then help other people with theirs. Be hands of mercy. Because you care for us, and you strengthen us to care for others. And if that's all we have to offer to this world, then we'll praise your name. We'll praise your name. If that's all we can offer to this world right now, if we are so lost everywhere else, the only thing we can offer is to be your caring hands, then that's what we do. We'll start there, and we'll continue in that work. I thank you and praise you for what you're doing in the hearts and minds of this church this morning, and we turn it all over to you in Jesus' name.